Okay, <clears throat> so good afternoon in Lagos or West Africa, and good morning, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Sandy BC, aka Kwe. Just before we get started, please, if it's possible, just mute momentarily, just to confirm that you can actually hear me. Hope my, my, my audio is good enough. Thank you so much. Uh, you could chat or you could just, I want to be sure that I'm audible enough. We can hear you, Prof. Okay, okay, great. So, so today, um, just once again, I want to apologize for what happened last week. I, it was, uh, even though we later on, I uh, came back to uh, uh, engage with our community, unfortunately, making it very, very late was not just excusable. And today we have so many programs with the Tequidia Business Growth Playbooks uh, starting in just about two hours time and also the graduation for, for, for Tequidia Mini MBA Edition 5. So there were just so many things that our members will have to deal with here. So I do not necessarily expect uh, many. But we are, we've recorded it and we'll be putting the video for those who may not make it here. So uh, what I wanna share here is just to have a conversation on a real redesign, the things that we are seeing across market segments and across market territories. The world we live today is technologically being redesigned. And the implication is that the, the business empires of today may not necessarily be the ones that we are going to see in the very near future. In short, the world is already in a state of flux because technology systems are changing the ordinance of market systems. So uh, using a place like this for Nigeria, for example, you see how the government through the Central Bank of Nigeria is trying to battle with the Nigerian currency. It's not just only in Nigeria, across most parts of the world. The, the leadership or the political leaders just trying to understand what is going on. So what is going on here is that the world is built on something that is totally different than the world was the world was ring runner. So you go to Europe every day, they are finding Waza, they are finding Amazon, they are finding Facebook. All those fees are a result of just perturbations in the old order they had. So if you look at it critically, there are new empires in the world, there are new business systems in the world, and the world is trying to respond. But for us, the question is this, what are going to become the opportunities that we have? What are going to become nurses upon which we can unlock values for ourselves, even career-wise, even as at the level of business and firms. So uh, people position themselves for the careers of the future. But people also position their companies for the opportunities of the future. Uh, just recently, the Nigerian government said they were going to introduce the e-currency, uh, the e-NAR, uh, the digital currency. And that digital currency, what it means here is that since seventh century when the Tang dynasty in China introduced the paper money. The world is going through another evolution where a new type of currency to a large extent is going to be used as scale. So what are going to be the changes that we see? Are they going to cause massive dislocations to the current empires of today? So in this conversation, I want to have this talk and then we also look at the path to the casters. The castles are essentially the opportunities therein. And how do we overcome the modes to get to the cast? So I give you back this puff about 2,000 years of GDP. You can see that the world has never been in a state of tasks. Uh, there are cases where empires have come, nations have risen, and nations have also fallen. There was a time the dominant economy was China, of course, in the last seven, eight centuries, China has had a very significant role in this, at least since. So China was there. There was also the time when India was extremely dominant. So the dominant, very, very dominant. And of course, in the 20th century, you can call it American century. Just before that, it's also the time the European, within the European, you have 
the hierarchy that was during the Russian Revolution. So but the Industrial Revolution essentially could say ended in 1896-97, when America took over to become the largest economy in the world. So the US is losing a lot of space now to China. And <laughs> you can see that China is opening it up. And most people do believe that in this century that China is going to be the largest economy in the world. So the point is this, empires come, empires go, and a new ones also come. It's not about a new thing. It has always been the world of the world, but there is something that is consistent. If you look through this curve, you see that nations rise because there are so many critical factors which are important. And for using United States and Canada and, and uh, China, the two dominant economies today, you could see that there is a massive translation around the birth of America around 1776, when the US did so many critical things that the world copied. And as a result of that, they now started experiencing exponential growth. There's exponential growth, essentially saying that they are no more growing in a kind of a linear fashion. They're now growing at a very, very faster scale. This is more than quadratic, it's actually exponential. So. This parabolic curve, China is experiencing it now, but not most of the parts of the world could actually join this part. Africa today is not, Nigeria today is not. In short, our major challenge today is that Nigeria is even, even decelerated. Because if you look at our GDP many, many years ago, just about seven, eight years ago, we we're actually in a better position than we are today. In short, today we are getting back to where we are roughly about 40 years ago. A new report just came out this morning where they stated that 73% of Nigerians would like to leave the country if they have an opportunity. So what is happening here that people do not see massive acceleration of economic opportunity for them to participate on. And that's a very huge problem because we are not ramping up the growth that we need in order to improve the welfare and the standard of living of the cities. Because uh, the GDP, when divided by the population, give you the the, the per capita income. And when GDP is not growing and the, and the population is increasing, the implication of that is that more people are going to be poor, more people are going to poverty. So looking at 100 years using American 10 top companies or five specifically, you could see that about 17, uh, 1917, US Steel, American Telecom, Standard Oil, and these were the dominant companies in the United States. And then roughly 50 years later, you could see that um, they move from those elemental building blocks of infrastructure to uh, a kind of a quasi knowledge systems like IBM, American Telephone, Kodak, and General Motors, Standard Oil, still there. Then if these are mainly infrastructure entities. But today, the largest entities in the United States are Apple, Alphabet, which is Google, Microsoft, Amazon, and Facebook. In short, today, looking at just roughly this month, uh, the largest entities in terms of market capitalization, you see that Apple is there, Microsoft is there, Google, Amazon, and Facebook. Now, if you look at these plots uh, or the data sets, you could see one thing. They have the infrastructure companies as being dominant. That was a time of acceleration of, of growth. And then they now have the building blocks for growth. They now have knowledge companies as dominant. So if I have this mindset here, one thing I can extrapolate here is that there is going to be a moment that Africa, we are still at this phase, at this 1917-1967 phase. We have the most important companies and economies are companies that are focusing on critical fundamental infrastructure. So then after that, they were now moving into um, companies like Google Alphabet, Google, um, Microsoft and co knowledge companies. So if you look at Nigeria, for example, using Nigeria's case study, uh, we have MTN, uh, we have uh, Airtel. These are the largest market caps in Nigeria today. And these are infrastructure companies. And then you have cements, uh, the two cements, Dangode cement, Dangua cement, the infrastructure. Then you also have a food company, which is actually the most important infrastructure to start with. 
Then, um, but if you look at the right, which gives you the US companies, you are seeing knowledge companies. So what it tells you is what is really defining the US company and Nigerian company, you could see there is a high level of latency. What Nigeria is doing today, United States have done those things about 50 years ago. Just looking at how the valuation of the companies have played out. So 50 years ago, the most dominant companies in America, they were co telecommunication companies. And about 100 years ago, the most dominant companies in America was companies in steel and cement and, and food companies. But Nigeria is still becoming relevant in those areas now. And so after we have fixed that paralysis, that it is, the next thing that will happen is that we will now begin to see companies that are moving into the knowledge phase. So you now have our own version of Google, Amazon, and Co coming up, but it's gonna take time. So if you look at the US pattern, 1917, 1957 uh, or so, thereabouts, it does not have to be broken into phases, just like they have in the United States. They have 1917, 1967, but you could see that Nigeria is merging both eras together as one. And as the, as the country is merging both of them, we are expecting that a translation from this era to the era that will become knowledge is going to be extremely rapid and fast. So there is nothing like leapfrogging this fundamental redesign. You know, everyone, people will write about leapfrogging because you have a mobile app. Those things are just ephemeral. You have to build infrastructure of the future for you to have the opportunity of building the layers of knowledge systems that will capture value from them. So Nigeria has Nigeria is building them. Uh, Dangote Refinery is coming up, and there are so many other entities in this space that are coming up. And as they are being built, this infrastructure now we can also provide the opportunity, the pillars for us to experience uh, those exponential knowledge systems. So, but. Everything is changing. And what I mean that everything is changing is that in as much as we are not there yet, we are not seeing knowledge companies, maybe Nigeria Stock Exchange or Miss African Stock Exchange. But there is a fundamental redesign and we are in that Cambrian moment where things are beginning to, to take shape. And, and we cannot just ignore it because it's going to be extremely very critical and huge. It's going to be massive. And all most of us are going to see that. So in these companies and entities, internet has played a significant role. It has changed the structures of markets. It has also brought new things that the companies that are going to become dominant in future, I expect them to be technology enabled in Africa. The same thing that has happened in, in, in the United States, the same thing that happened in in most parts of the, of, the, of the developed world, these companies are going to be technology driven. In short, the, 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 the largest market in market capitalization in, our, in Africa, which is NASPAS, which is based in South Africa. NASPAS is so huge that it can buy all the stock in Nigeria with less than about 40% of its market cap. So it's so huge that if it begins to shop all the stock exchanges in Nigeria, its market capitalization can actually buy everything so the implication there is this company focuses on investing in technology companies. So you could see that the acceleration of technology nations has provided an opportunity for this company to become very dominant. So I see three critical factors for these empires of the future. First is aggregation. The businesses that will become great in Africa have to love and love how they can do aggregation. And there is also going to be ability to control demand and also driving that construct of service reception. What do I mean by aggregation? Uh, aggregation is the nexus that you don't have to create all the factors of production, especially your raw material elements, uh, for you to actually build a business. You just look at what Uber does. Uber does not buy all the cars that you find within the Uber ecosystem. Airbnb does not buy all does not build all the hotels or, or, the, or the homes you see in the ABM. If you look at the logistics companies in Nigeria, you can see the same parallel. Lorry system does not uh, have all those trucks. 
you know, system. So the, the fact is this, that these entities are growing faster than the traditional, um, traditional 20th century business model. And I do believe that as technology continues to be refined and improved, these are companies that are going to give us some of the empires of the future that we see. So the key thing, they would now have to have a means of controlling demand, and they also have to deliver great customer service. Let me explain it this way. In the very old time, the, the great newspapers of old, they were in charge. You know, Guardian, Punch, these days, depending on where you live, or Guardian newspaper in London, or the New York Times, anything they did not publish, no one would read about. So they were the gatekeepers in their respective regional these markets. So if, if the Guardian Nigeria, this day, and Tribune and, and few other newspapers did not publish any news, no one would know about it because supply was under the control of gatekeepers. It was bounded and constrained that if they didn't publish it, no one knows. But today, that's no more the case. If there is a breaking news somewhere in Nigeria today, and, and his, this newspaper has refused to publish. That will not change much because there is somebody who can go to Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and even his own her blog and write about it. So what has happened here, the supply of news is no more what is driving the market. What is now critical is who can organize all the disparate sources of news around the world so that people can make sense of what is happening. So that's where the power now moves from those that are supplying the news to those that are controlling those that are reading the news. So a breaking news is coming up in a battle. Where do you go? You go to, first thing you go to Google and type it. When you type it in Google, that opportunity gives you for you to, Google will not take it to the right. So that is the very fundamental thing that the advertisers now understand that what matters now is not the source of the news, but what matters now is who has the people who can actually help you control that, that particular piece of news. So advertiser would like to advertise in Google instead of going to Guardian or Punch or these day to place advertisement because the Google and Facebook, they have the control of the people reading the news. So, that business model is, is, is ramping up across market segments. And we do believe that as Africa moves from that infrastructure base into this new knowledge driven company of the future, that companies that are building around this framework are going to be the companies that will have a significant win. And uh, we are seeing no new business models in this space. And unlike the old traditional e-commerce, there is a, an e-commerce paradigm which is picking up rapidly now. So if you look at the e-commerce system, uh, we have companies like Aliso. Aliso raised $10.5 million just last month. Uh, Trade Depot has raised millions of millions of dollars. Supplier raised, I think, $1.5 million. Omnibus raised $3 million. And Minting also, they all raised. What are they doing? What they are doing here is that they have an app they go to um, supermarkets or small shops in the Dumoto market or Nature Aba and Kanu or, or where there are open markets. And they ask those men and women that are selling in those shops, you don't need to close your shop to go to Unilever. You don't need to close your shop to go to Proto and Gamble to buy things. Anytime you are running out of stock of, of detergent, just go to uh, uh, our app, place an order, and within six, 12 hours, we're going to deliver the item to your shop. So what is happening here is that the shop owner stays in his or her shop, they will deliver it. You don't even need to deal with the logistics. You don't need to go and queue. You don't have to take hire any vehicle to go and bring those things. You don't have to deal with big companies like Unilever and Proton Gamble because these companies will bring those. They also give you trust. You know, you are buying from respected brands that you can have a lot of confidence that you're actually getting it from the right source. So what is going on here is that the markets have seen that this could be a better paradigm for digitization of retail. Unlike the old model, let's say what Conga Jumia, what, what are they were doing? Because if you look at what is going on here, these companies, 
they raised tons of money, but they were not able to break into the market very well because of the marginal cost difficulty where because of lack of postal service, distributing to the retail space was hard. So they said, okay, if I want to reach every person in this community, I may not have the capacity to deliver to the end users, but in this AK market, uh, maybe four week market in, in the Eastern part of Nigeria, I can deliver to these shop owners and these shop owners, when people now come to buy from them, they buy from them. It may be a better business model because there's no postal service to reach the end customer. The end customer just have to find a way to make themselves to the store or go to the market. This business model <clears throat> could actually be a better paradigm shape than what we had in the old traditional e-commerce. Where people will spend millions of dollars, at the end of the day, they will not see any, any value. I know that uh, if you look at the total money that Jumia has raised, including the IPO, it must have raised more than a billion dollars. But what is this market cap? And if you look at Conga before it was sold, I think Conga raised more than hundred million dollars. And at the end of the day, that didn't save it. So a business model like this, where Alessa just operating only in the battle, raised $10.5 million, is a validation that technology is already changing how businesses are going to be wired. I am not aware of any retailer in Ibado, any retailer or any supermarket or any merchant in Ibado that was running the old industrial age business playbook that will have more market valuation than Alessa. Ladies and gentlemen, what I'm trying to say in other words is that for Alessa to have raised 10.5 million, I was not expecting them to give more than 50% of their company. So at least the company should be awards, should be worth at least $30 million. What is $30 million? You look at $30 million using the pure play Nigerian currency. You are looking at very, very huge amount of money. You're looking at billions of billions of naira. There is no supermarket or shop in Ibadan that could match that. So what has happened is that somebody has built the largest e-retail participants on a mobile app, bigger than any shop or supermarket in the city of Ebado. That is the point I'm trying to make here. That is how these empires are going to come. The pioneers and the participants are going to drive the future of wealth. And this is based on my postulation that by 2030, 80% of the richest Nigerians would have made money through technology. Because I know that Alessa is richer, bigger than any shop, any merchant, any supermarket, whatever you can have in the city of Ibadan. That is what we're talking about here. $10 million typically will give you around five things today, using whatever we are using, it's gonna give you about five billion. You're so looking at 15 billion naira market cap for a company. I am not sure there is any supermarket in Nigeria that can match it or any open market shop that can match it. That's what is happening there. So that is going to be the shape because they are using tech to power that empire of the future. And it's not just only in retail, you can also see the same thing in digital banking, FinTech solutions. That today, Kuda Bank's market cap is bigger than the market cap of Fidelity Bank, Wema Bank, Jay's Bank, Unity Bank, Stalin Bank combined. And look at Flora Wave, you can keep adding more pieces together. It's as close as the market cap of Astambic IBTC. And what they have done here, these companies go into that customer reception. Kuda, when you talk about customer reception, talk about how do you remove those fees that banks ask people to pay? And because of the removal of those fees, the customers came in growth. And you look at OPE, OPE also asks itself, how are we going to build a solution where we're going to make customers feel they are winning? Remember those days when they had the oh, 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 oh ride and oh, oh, whatever. They said, okay, a place where you have to pay 500 naira will ask you to pay 300, 200 naira so that you can ride free, you can, you can save 300 naira and then you will study OPE. Open app. So they have built a fundamental thing in the minds of customers that they can give you value. 
and customers like value. And they control demand. And controlling that demand is really what happens, what matters. OPE value proposition was not that it was doing any other thing, any other FinTech was not doing. But the OPE strategy was that by asking you to take a, a cheap ride with O ride, the Okada with a motorbike, it forces you to install the app, OPE. And once you have installed the, the OPE, you've installed it. And once you install it, OPE has you as part of the demand move. The best product we have in Techidia Institute is not that we actually teach anything you can find on YouTube or from any place. The best product we have in Techidia Institute is because we have many members in our network. Like when I was conceiving, coming up with a digital business, I need to have a mechanism to actually influence demand. I said, we have to have a blog. And I have to have an active writing kind of a ritual on, on LinkedIn. Because the product, the supply of the product is not really what matters. The ability to have people that can actually listen to you is actually more important. I'm sorry to say this. You know, if you go to University of Lego, there are people that prepare better courses. They have better content. But the problem is that if they say, I am going to start a program or a training program, because they may not even have demand. They don't have contact to users. What happens? No one comes because that is it. So the fundamental thing is this. Controlling demand is going to be a very critical part. It's not just providing the supply. Of course, aggregation. What is really this aggregation? Aggregation is talking about, I just built my stack. I want to bring everyone to the fold. It's also the same thing of controlling demand. You don't have to do everything by yourself. That is a fundamental thing for these empires of the future. They flood away, could I say, let me go to do business in China. Say, no, let me just integrate with Alipay. And also, let me also do business in Europe. Say, no, let me integrate with WorldPay. So these empires of the future, they always understand how they can partner. And through that partnership, they scale faster and they actually accomplish things faster. So, Looking at the African economy, I do believe vividly that we should be at $9 trillion GDP by 2030. We are around less than three, just around three trillion because we are underperformed. But if you look at Africa's potentials, especially minerals and hydrocarbons and all the things we have, we should actually be one of the finest and the, and, and the very great continent in the world. So, but if there is a fundamental shift today, let's assume there is a fundamental shift, uh, what we're going to see here is that there could be a massive growth. So knowledge is going to be very critical for that future. And also the spirit of entrepreneurial capitalism. The spirit of entrepreneurial capitalism is just having risk takers. See, it takes a different gene of mindset, not in gene biologically, but the mindset, using it figuratively here, for somebody to say, I want to invest 500,000 Naira, and then hope that something good will come out of it. Another person says, I'm going to invest $5 million. Another person says, I'm going to invest $500 million. You need to have people that can actually take that level of risk. If you don't have them, nothing is going to happen. So it's just like looking at Dangolo refinery business, looking at uh, Jeff Bezos going to build those rocket ships they were building. Sometimes they put billions of dollars at the end of the day, the setting team may not be known. I recall vividly when they introduced that good refinery around 2013, 2012, or thereabouts. They said they were going to commission it at 2015 or 2016. We are already finishing 2021. They are not even sure of commission in 2023. And some people are saying it will end up in 2025. So what, what is going on here is there are risks. You need to have people that can take those risks. So you need that. And then you need labor. Labor now means the executors of that vision. You need to have ability to, to bring young people who can actually understand what matters academically, intellectually, structurally, otherwise. They are going to help you take that. There are companies you cannot start in Gabon today because you don't have the talent workforce necessary for you to run that business. And there are also companies you cannot start in Lagos because unfortunately you don't have the environmental system that will help you run. It doesn't mean about, it's not just about 
the, the intellectual capacity. It's also the exposures of the young people. So all these things are going to be critical. Those that can manage them are going to be those that will win that future. So agriculture is a great area. Healthcare, we've not even done anything in the continent. I recall vividly those days in Ovim in other states when I was in the secondary school. You know, we live in the village. We, we still remember the Superdome General Hospital. We are, hey, if, they, if there was one auntie or one uncle or one village out that had a very big problem, they say, oh, they are taking him to Superdome General Hospital. Unfortunately, that hospital is no more. You know, and I recall vividly also the, 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 there was a veterinary clinic opposite the Ovim Police Station. We are in my alma mater, secondary technical school of him, we used to pass through that veterinary clinic. And we used to mock, see those people, they are going there to be walking, taking care of dogs and cats. I say, how can somebody go to school to learn how to take care of dogs and cats? That was many years ago. Those things were evident. But you know what happened? All those things have gone. So in a, in, in a real sense of it, efforts that Africa had made many decades ago We've actually reversed them, unfortunately, negatively. So that means that ability to catch up to what we are maybe 20 years ago is actually what we need to do. And that was the reason why the former Central Bank governor of Nigeria said that Nigeria's per capita earning power today is getting back to how it was 40 years ago. So healthcare is key. Education, of course, is key. Energy transport, supply chain, and real estate. And I'm telling you that one of the most latent opportunities in Nigeria is real estate. I know people in America, they want to buy lands. Bill Gates here in America, he owns hectares of land. Ted Turner, the founder of CNN, owns land. People put the best investments they can have buying lands. I'm talking about real estate in terms of building. You just buy empty swaths of land. When you buy the empty swaths of land, that could be the best possible investment because it's just a piece of land. It's never going to disappear. It's just there. That's what some of these rich guys, how they preserve their wealth. Because as generations rise, population will increase, people will need more space to build things. And that means most likely they come to you to sell to them. But how are you going to buy land in a place like Nigeria. You're living in America, somebody gives you a piece of paper in Oshobo, and you don't know whether that thing has been manipulated last night. And then they give you another one in Omwai. You don't even know whether that is real or not. Inability to fix that problem is the reason why we don't have velocity on our land. But if you can fix that, that I can live in Adia and buy land in Kwara State, and that land belongs to me, Anytime I want to sell it, I don't even need to visit that land. I sell it to another person. And the government does what it has to do. We will see some of the richest people in Nigeria to be those living in the villages. I've made a case about that, what I call the digital asset registry, how we can unlock massive land velocity and now accelerate well to rural communities. And it's something I'm so confident that if we do that, we're going to see, as I discussed with the senator, but it, the problem remains, people just have to willingly be open to help the nation. Uh, if there are not things for people to make money on most times, we're not a lot of people are interested in it. But this is a very critical part. So the empires of the future are going to come from those that can unlock some of these critical opportunities that are happening. And I will just use this as a case study here. It's not just going to be the infrastructure in terms of building. It's also going to look at what is the business model you are running, you know, and, and I'll make this case very well. Your unit economics has to be good. And there, there is an e-commerce company in Kenya called Sendi. And what Sendi has done here is that if you are living in a village and you buy something from a supermarket, another person in, in that community picks that thing up from the supermarket and brings to you. In other words, an e-commerce company does not need to build a lot of infrastructure in terms of having vehicles to be delivering things from one house to the other, because that's going to be very, very expensive. You cannot improve your marginal cost, average fixed cost performance. But if you can buy it in Facetag in Lagos and somebody picks it up and delivers to you, that cost is going to be a better, better 
And that is where business model can come to rescue and accelerate the deficiency in a critical infrastructure that we already have in the continent. We have a critical infrastructure deficiency on coastal service, but new business models can solve that problem. Sendi has shown that they can overcome that problem in Kenya. And also all these trade people that are working on B2B e-commerce, they're, they're also figuring out how to do that. Because for a business to scale, it has to ramp up scale and also make sure that the marginal cost does not always consistently go up even as it begins to scale. So the empires is critical. And that trajectory is that people need to think just beyond an element. And I, I will close this by saying here is that um, as, we, as, we, as we look into that future, as we look into those empires of the future, what is evident is that we are going to see some of these entities, just like the same translation that we have seen in what happened in America. I do believe that at the end of the whole, then everything in the world is just the same. Everything is just a function of the state where you are. If you look at patterns, when something happens in Kenya, just give it three, four, five years, you begin to see the same thing, a similar thing happening in West Africa. And it happens in West Africa, give it some, it goes to happen in East Africa. And, and, and that's the thing. In short, some of the business models that we run in the Kenya capital, when we see that something is working well in Kenya, we just quickly look for a way to replicate it in, in West Africa, because it's just the same. And if you look here in US, what they have done, everyone has to go through that process. But the way you approach it could be different because when they did that thing, they may not have had internet. Now you have internet, you can approach it different way. So to, to win and become the empires of the future, one now has to think about how these knowledge systems driven by digital technology can power whatever you do. And it can work across every any industrial sector. It's not just about talking about uh, digital technology. This is not really about digital, this is about agriculture, real estate, everything that we are doing, technology can overlay on top of it, accelerate wealth and create massive value. The biggest opportunity in real estate, unfortunately, is not really building. The biggest opportunity in real estate today is making it transparently easy for the acquisition, transfer, purchase and buying of real estate property. If anyone can make that powerful, you become the richest real estate organization in, in Nigeria today. Unfortunately, you can't do that without government. But if you can work and reform government, anyhow, you can do that. And they ask you to lead it. You become another than good. Because people will actually willingly come into that party. How can you have 100 hectares of land that you become a poor man? Because that 100 hectares of land is nowhere in Nigeria's balance sheet. But if we put it in the balance sheet, the bank will see Mr. Ikeduru has 100 hectares of land and he just needs 50,000 Naira loan. So, okay, he has assets somewhere in this country. We are going to use that as a collateral to give him 50,000 Naira. But because he does not have the 50, 100 hectares of land, bank sees him as a very poor man, even though the man is sitting in the world. The only thing that is different is not that the land is not there. The only thing is that there is no insight into that land. If technology opens it up, if anyone can lead on that technology redesign, you see that the world will come to converge. And that is actually a bigger real estate than whatever people are doing. So ladies and gentlemen, this is what I have here for a perspective of these empires of the future. I'm confident that if we pursue the business construct of aggregation, controlling demand, customer reception, we can pioneer and change the audience across different market segments, agriculture, healthcare, real estate, education, energy, transport, supply chain, and more. And that will deliver huge value. And most of us will capture huge value as well. So thank you so much for, for joining us and thank you. So if you have questions, I will be very happy to, to take your question and uh, I, let me know if you have any questions. Thank you.
Uh, yeah, Prof, uh, thank you for the presentation. I'm smart by name. Okay, it's a pleasure, smart. Um, first question I have is regarding the mini MBA. Okay. I have taken the model, which is uh, for one year. Uh, I think, yes, one year. Or oh, what is it called? Um, hmm. Yeah, you can describe. I, you can't remember the name. Yeah, I think it's about uh, the one of uh, one year program. Okay, okay. You take the annual plan. Yes, the annual, annual plan. Yeah, okay. the annual plan. Yeah. However, so how would it be? How is it different from the normal um, other MBA, MBAs like the one I see? This which is a fifty thousand naira and all that. What's the major difference there? Okay, so the annual plan is basically giving you the option of three different. The Kidia editions for the cost of two. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's just the only difference. So you're going to attend three editions for the cost of two. But basically, if you have to pay each edition, the three would have cost you, let's say, 150,000 naira using Nigerian naira. Mm -hmm. But if you are paying for the annual plan, you pay 100,000 naira, meaning that we are giving you a discount of one edition. Our okay. editions vary. Every edition has, like, the next edition we are coming up, we are really focusing on the new economy. We just think that um, this thing they call central bank digital currency, where people will be paying. We actually just want to make sure our members have a very good understanding of that. Okay. So, and so that's the way we structure our programs. They are never the same. Even the faculty members we bring life, we have a, a structured, plan what we want to accomplish at the end of it. And this uh, doesn't also mean that they are immune to paying for, to review their pro uh, projects? Uh, no, I didn't like, hear uh, uh, It means that everybody has to pay to review his project assignment or project or report as it's uh, indicated. It, yeah, there. yeah. For, for those annual plan, if you want to do a project review, homework review, you pay that 10,000 naira. It's not included okay. in that. Uh, Three editions. So the three editions include the annual plan includes three editions and two capstone. Capstone are the research work you do with us. Okay. And increasingly, most of our members that are applying for scholarship and also admission abroad, some of them that did a capstone, they attach that capstone, which is like a project report, mm -hmm. a sign of showcasing that this was what they did during their the, the mini MBA. Because it becomes a verifiable physical document that came out of the study instead of just taking the courses without having any physical. Mm -hmm. So the annual plan has two offers free in addition to the three editions, but it doesn't include the whole work. Okay, okay. So uh, technically, the last question is um, regarding um, the whole uh, paradigm economic shift that you presented, looking at a U.S. Uh, uh, kind of a sequential growth from uh, 1917 to 67 to where we are, they are now. But uh, looking at us who are Nigerians, one of the challenges that I have seen is that some of us have uh, the technical know why, but do not have the technical know how. Is there an opportunity for those participating in this NDA to have, let me use myself as an example. I have a concept that I want to build or develop but uh, I may not have the finance and I may not also have uh, the technicality to build this application or to build this platform. Uh, is there a, uh, a provision by you people, your organization to help people like me to meet or to find a co-founder who can uh, be my CTO and help me to come up with solution to this problem? Yeah, actually uh, we have had many members that came together, started things, they connected here. We really have so many of them. But there is um, one thing that we are not trying to do a lot here uh, because we are not necessarily trying to just try to be everything. Maybe uh, trying to start matching people with that because we think there are some organizations that are wired in that space that can do that better. For instance, the AI hub, in Nigeria from Data Science Nigeria, they are sending their members to take their mini MBA because they think that we have 
a very deeper business managerial, business knowledge and uh, business administration program. Mm -hmm. But if you go to them, <clears throat> they have all these AI and geeks, very extremely brilliant people there. So if we, uh, if we focus on what we do very well, and then if you're not looking for an AI co-founder, yeah, you just go to Data Science Nigeria and, and then find them. The same thing happens with CC Hub. So our program does not test people's technical competence. So there is just no basis for us to start making, okay, this guy is a good technical guy because we don't even have a means of ascertaining that. So, mm -hmm. so that's, that's the reason why we are not doing that, that matching. But increasingly we have seen that people uh, are actually finding a way they organize and do that. And that's why we created the Tekidia Hub so that, and also the comment section, you could just point it out, I'm building something and I'm looking for somebody who has the technical expertise. And if you write to our admin and she can also look around some members that say they have this skill, they are looking for opportunity and we, we can see how we have it. We, we do not have that structure system to make that much impossible. Mm -hmm. But now there's another question you are, you are building up about Nigeria having tech. Actually, most of the things most of us are coming. Let me show you this plot here. I, I think you can see my screen here. <clears throat> yes, yeah. yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. If you look at the, this is Nigeria GDP per capita just using 2010. Uh, it used to be uh, uh, 2,336. And he moved to, the, and the peak was roughly around 2014. Now, this data has consistently been going down. You see how it's been going down. So as you see this, what is happening here that productivity has dropped. Most things are just falling apart. I mean, I don't want you to go political about this, but what I'm trying to say there was that this was not really about Nigeria's not being able to do things. That's what I'm trying to counter with data. We were actually getting things done. Now, if this trajectory has slope has continued, by now we should be hitting more than 3,005. And that means we would have doubled so many good things across communities by now. But now we are now back to nearly for where we were 40 years ago. Uh, I mean, getting to where we are 40 years ago now. So the, the, the issue there is a very huge one. And that's, that's also affects, everyone is looking for survival. People are no more talking about how do I join a, a startup because startup takes a lot of toil on your life. You don't have money and just so. So that's it. But just send out this a note to, to my team. And we have a couple of people that are also looking for opportunities that they have technical skill sets. Some of them lost their jobs with the, uh, what was the name of this, uh, uh, this software company, Andela. You know, when Andela fired a lot of guys in, in Lagos, those guys have very good skills. So if you can get any Andela graduate, you have a very good co-founder. So all you just need to do is provide the business acumen and leadership why he or she will provide the technical. So both of you coming together will be a very great thing to do. So just check them up. And we have a couple of them and um, uh, maybe that could help. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Do, do we have any more questions, gentlemen and ladies? Uh, we just have about 10 more minutes and please, okay, go ahead, Sullivan. Mm. Mm. Yeah, go ahead. And good afternoon, bro. Yeah, good, good afternoon, afternoon, everyone. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry I joined late. You know, the time, 2, 2 p.m. Saturday is something I else. know, I know. Middle of the time. Sorry, we have other <laughs> things coming up later in the day. That was the reason why. <laughs> so, sorry about that. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, sir. So, I, I'm, I'm keen to ask, um, if one is interested in sending you a pitch deck of, um, of uh, his startup, but finds out that that when I mean you, I mean Tequila Capital. But mm -hmm. finds out that maybe um, Tequila Capital already has a, a company in their portfolio that maybe uh, operates in the same field or in the same space, but not the same product. Uh, is it um, is it something to be worried about, or we should just look elsewhere? Uh, no, okay. actually, Tequila Capital is not a VC fund. The, those okay. decisions are made by our syndicate members. So we don't have that problem. So technically, we can, our members who say, I like Conga, 
Some will invest in Kong. Another will say, I like Jumia. Some will invest in, in Jumia. So we don't have that typical VC problem because we're not managing fund for anybody. So this is what we do. We look at the companies we think that are interesting and now present them to our members and our members decide, okay, I want to invest in this one, I want to invest. So uh, you, you get the point I'm making here. Yeah. Mm. Yes, I do, I do, amazing. Yeah, yeah. So we, as the Kidia Institute, we do not decide what our members actually invest. Of course, we create companies we think are good, but they make that, that decision. So there is no specific way for you to say, okay, because this company is already uh, in Tequila Capital invested in. No, we have thousands, we have dozens of people in our, our program and there could be thousands of uh, companies in the world. Not all the dozens will hold on to So one person can own Kung, another person will own Jumia. That does not really matter. Hmm. So you don't yeah, have to worry even if you have invested. Book. You say what? I said, that's an amazing playbook, sir. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, we, we tried to invent something new and it has worked out very well. Last quarter, we did 3.5 million, which means that we are even bigger than some of the big VCs. We came up with that playbook ourselves. We just changed the way we do that. Like what I, I, I tell here, that, that innovation does not have to happen in technology. It could happen on your business model. The way we structure the Kidia Capital makes it easy for us to uh, offer value in, to the community and, and the community is uh, very, very trusted. It's very, very uh, positive and in what we're doing. Yeah. So if you have something nice, you don't have to worry whether we have a company in that space. It's relevant because of the way we're structured. Okay, so, and, and secondly, definitely we have to show traction, yeah? Yes. So we, if, if yes. I believe we are still too early, uh, we'll have to wait for a while before we come forward. Yes. We usually like to see a basics for you to, to ask for that money. So, yeah, yeah. We usually like to... But saying you are too early, you never know. So if you have anything, you could just share that. We would like to see. Yeah. There are so many metrics. There are some that invest because they have a business, they're looking at a company that can use as a pipeline to support, to offer service to them. Uh, we know one that invested in a logistics company because he had another business he's looking for a logistics company that can integrate it the way he wants. So you may be too early, but if you have the, the, the business vision or, or the technology, he can, he can, your customer can basically fund you. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. So thank you so, very much, sir, for that insight. Thank you. Okay, great. So, gentlemen and ladies, uh, do you still have more questions? And uh, uh, let me know. And let me check. Yeah. Sorry for what happened I'm last week, as I said. To join the Kira Capital Syndicate. Okay. Um, okay. I think that's Namde. Okay. If you want to join, just you could connect with Namde or just check our website. And uh, it's, it's an amazing playbook. And we are hoping that. Uh, we can make it easier for businesses to to thrive and also some entrepreneurs to advance their missions. And like I challenge us, these empires of the future will not come through going to build quantum computers or those things you think. But it's just ability to do a lot of things and coming up with a business model that can help you uh, drive, drive growth. Hello, Prof. Um, thank you so much. This is a first speaking. Um, is there or was there a handshake um, in between um, the public sector and the private sector when the um, Americans were transforming? Um, so just also looking at the Nigerian sector, um, because I'm just looking at this transformation is more more than private, private businesses, um, private plugins, individual plugins. Um, is there a handshake or is there something we can do? Especially when you mentioned um, like the asset registry, looking at land. Um, so handshaking the, the, between the public sector and the private sector, was there anything done in America or is there something we can do? Yeah, absolutely. There are many things 
the American did. I can, let me just cite three examples. The first was the um, eminent domain. When Carnegie wanted to, to into the steel business, they wanted to build railway lines. You know, in US, in some in some railway systems, they are actually privately owned. I think uh, uh, Warren Buffett owns a train track. So that train track um, is specifically for moving cargoes. So you can have an individual, you build a train track from like, say, Lagos to Kano, and you have your train so that um, for people that are producing things in Lagos can use your train to move things. So it's not government that, ha that must own train track. So for, for an individual to build that train track from, from Lagos to Kano to move things through train, you have to pass through many private lands of individuals. So under that time, there was nothing like that. <clears throat> so men like Kenigi uh, went to the government. They came what we call eminent domain. I, I'm not a lawyer. I think I'm pronouncing it right. Uh, maybe a Paris. So I mean, maybe I say, if, if this land, there's a one acre of land, that is a public good, that this can improve supply chain, government will help you get that land, put it so that that train truck can go. That was one of the most catalytic things that the US government did to make it possible for them to build those infrastructure systems. Because without that, there is no way any human being can negotiate with thousands of landowners from Lagos to Kano equivalent before you can build that train track. But with the government put that eminent domain track, build, but be built, any person that is hurt will compensate. That was one. Then the second one was US government has this whole mindset of losing money in order to gain money in future, you know? So if you look at e-commerce, when e-commerce came up, people were not interested in supporting Amazon. People were not interested in buying things online. So the government said, um, you know, what do we do? So, okay, let's go in to remove sales tax from Amazon so that anybody that buys something online will not have to pay tax. Will not have to pay tax. That sells tax. So, Remember, Amazon is buying from the same place like other physical stores. Amazon is not producing the dishwashers. It's not producing anything. So what happened? Because if you go to the physical store, it costs you extra 8 to 10% more the sales tax. But if you buy from Amazon, it's free. You don't pay that sales tax. Amazon became cheaper. So Americans started buying online. And when Americans started buying online, U.S. intentionally undercut the physical stores to boost a new market. where the senators felt that was going to be the future of the world. And you know what? They used that sales tax. I mean, everyone stopped buying books from library, sorry, from, from bookshop. Because when you buy from bookshop, you pay tax. When you buy online from Amazon books, you don't pay any tax. And just like that, they created that e-commerce industry. They also did this, they have done this kind of thing many, many times. So they, but they are only that they do it is universal. It's not like I have a favorite guy. Amazon could have been the poster child because Amazon was evident. But if you also created an e-commerce business that time, you benefit from the same thing. So it wasn't like exclusively Amazon. So that's that's where, and then you look at their logistics. The actually this China is even better on this. You can buy an iPhone case. If you're living in the US, go to eBay, you can buy an iPhone case for Maybe three, three, two dollar. Somebody will ship it from you from China to your house in the US. Because China has subsidized the supply chain to make it nearly impossible for any part of the world to compete with small manufacturers in China. So that's why it's cheaper to move a container from China to Lagos than to move from Lagos to Sokoto or to move from Lagos to uh, Kogi State. Because China will make the cost of shipping logistics so cheap that there is just no reason why you have to go to Vietnam, go to the Philippines, or go to any part of the world, because China is ready to absorb that cost. So the same thing happens in US. The postal service in US is loss making, it makes a lot of losses, it loses me billions. But US says, without the postal service, rural America will be cut out of trade. Some areas in the United States will be cut out of trade. And that means you begin to lose those economies because they will be disparately disconnected from the mainstream America. You know, because there are so many places in Alaska, there is no human being that will deliver anything there unless postal service, because 
delivering something from where I live, Alaska, maybe for US Postal Service, 50 cents. The government may be spending up to equivalent of $33 to deliver that, but they will still charge me 50 cents. So why do they want to do that? Government wants to make sure that that small city is not disconnected from American economy. So, but there's something the government says, okay, if we lose $12 billion a year on doing that, economy grows and people pay tax. We are going to make at least $300 billion on tax. Subtract $12 billion from $300 billion. Hey, that alone is a good business. So post office, don't try to just start making money crazy without thinking. We are provided that you are connecting this with America to make money, to be dynamic. The economic compensation will come from the taxes through the economic activity. And then we'll use that to calibrate how the losses you're making. You know, these are people that actually look at data. They think around the, it's a 360 dot. But in Nigeria, we killed the postal service because it wasn't making money. And then we killed the rural Nigeria. I recall vividly when I was in secondary school, we used to do PayPal, pay, 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 pay. you know, I used to do PayPal to, I remember the first letter I got from NASA. I was in secondary school. I sent a letter to NASA, one address my teacher gave me. I said, please send me materials. I just want to read about NASA. They sent it. You can, you see a magazine, you just see the address you send, they will send it to you. Now you go to the postal service, you push something, then all of a sudden your teacher says, hey, you have a mail in the, in the, the principal's office, go to the principal secretary, there are mails, you go there and pick it up. People that did not, people, young people are not enjoying that because we now felt that post office has to be 100% making money when the e-commerce came, I mean, when the internet came. So internet killed our postal service because the volume of mail dropped. But they did not allow it to kill their own in US and China because they felt it was still necessary for them to drive their economic future. So gentlemen and ladies, what I'm trying to say here is that it is not everything you see on newspapers or magazines that really make nations great. There are concerted effort by men and women who actually look at things in a very holistic picture. To just do, but it requires a lot of intellectual ability for people to actually do that. And when you have that in abundance, the, 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 the nation will always rise. So there was a very great effort through policies to make sure that America became what it is. And the same thing happens in China. And, and, they, and when nations do that, but the moving that translation of that policy into fixing frictions to market, private sector drove it. But behind it, there is something. In short, there is only one thing you can do today to kill Facebook. Make Facebook liable for anything posted on its website. If you do that, Facebook will shut down tomorrow. That was the reason why e-commerce of the future did not grow. One day, America said, we're going to put a law that digital platforms will not be responsible for whatever that is posted on their platform. And because of that, they can now allow millions of people to sign up so that they don't have to vet whatever you post. So that is one single policy. Because if that policy did not exist, there is no way they have to moderate everything that is posted. Because they will need more people, possibly, to manage more customer there. I, I hope I provided clarity on that, Sullivan. Yes, th thank you. So we just have to work something out with um, our Nigerian people at the top. Yes, and, and also I think it has to do with looking at the quality of leadership. And I think that's a bold statement per se. We say that every year. But to a large extent, um, um, unfortunately, um, I mean, we don't want to start going too political here. We, we have extremely not um, done very well in that space. <clears throat> We've not done very well in that space. Yeah. I mean, we, we are not making voting for political leaders based on who is the best. The tribal sentiments still was runs that, and that is the biggest challenge we have. Thank you so much, Prof. Thank you. All right. All right. Cheers. Bye bye. <laughs> okay. So, gentlemen and ladies, I want to thank you so much for joining us. And for members that are coming for the Kidia Growth Hour, we're just going to reconvene here, I think, by 4 30, Lake West African time. And then the graduation is seven is at uh, 7 p.m. West African time. So, let me allow you to catch up with other things. 
And thank you so much for, for joining us. I apologize again why this was a blown call. <laughs> Have a wonderful uh, evening and a good afternoon. Bye bye. Yes, sir. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate thank you. you. Very much, Paul.